And so I want to welcome everybody on social media and then wherever you're listening to us uh, online or through the web, God bless you. And I pray that tonight God will speak to you as well as everybody else in this room. And so before we go out uh, and jump into this sermon today, let us pray and see God's face again. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing. We thank you, Lord God, that you are sovereign. You're providential, God. You're a provider. You're a deliverer. You're a redeemer, God. Lord, you're full of grace and truth, God. We thank you for your blood, Lord God, that even though we don't deserve it, God, you gave it anyways, God. We thank you for your word, God, that even though we don't deserve your word, you gave it, God. And so we bless you, we praise you, and we magnify you, God. And we ask, Lord God, that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds to receive what your word says, God. Lord, we want the treasures of your word, God, that we may hold on to your word, God, and apply it to our lives and let your word be the very lamp into our feet and the light into our path. May you have your way, God, in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ one more time? Hallelujah. And so as you guys see on screen, today we're going to be talking about seeking God's direction. Seeking God's direction. And so we're still in our praying and fasting series. This will end next week will be the last uh, sermon called Seeking God's Growth. And so looking forward to that as well. And so today we want to talk about and really just indulge in the fact of seeking God's direction. Amen. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter three on down. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. How much of your heart should we trust in God? All of our hearts. And it says, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Right? How many ways should we acknowledge God? In all our ways. And he shall direct your paths. There's that word, direct. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. The writer of Proverbs chapter 3 is King Solomon himself, the wisest man that ever lived and the wisest man that will ever live. He goes beyond Amazon. He goes beyond Steve, the late Steve Jobs. He goes beyond uh, the one who made uh, Tesla. What is his name? Elon, Elon. Elon, that guy, right? Good old Elon, right? He goes beyond, you know, their wisdom and their understanding. Solomon was gifted with the wisdom that comes first from God. And he used that wisdom to write Proverbs so that he can begin to share his wisdom with the world. And the wisdom that he gave us in Proverbs chapter 3 leads to the direction of God while we make the word of God the very source and foundation of our lives. And so when King Solomon penned in Proverbs chapter 3 with the intention to direct and guide his readers and listeners to a state of freedom, a freedom that is lived out and kept by directing and guiding them to the source of all things for godliness and living that will keep them free. And that is the word of God. If you don't know what we're talking about today, when we talk about seeking God's direction, we are talking about the very foundation of God's word. It is the word of God that must direct our lives. It is the word of God that must filter our thoughts. It is the word of God that must filter our emotions. It's the word of God that must direct our feet to the direction to which God would have us to go in. It is the very word of God that should direct each and every one of our lives to all those who call themselves Christians. But the problem is in our day and age is that many people don't want to be directed by God's word. But yet we want the blessings out of God's word. We want God's riches. We want God's prosperity. We want God's blessings. We want God's avengings. We want God's security. We want God to do all the things that the word of God talks about. But then when it comes down to our very own lives, do we allow that same God and his word to direct us? When it comes down to choices that we need to make, 
Choices of, should I date this girl? Should I date this guy? Choices that should make, should I get this job? Should I go live here? Should I go get this car? Should I do whatever it is in our lives? Do we seek God and say, Lord, what is your direction? You see, for the year 2021, as we have started and still in the very beginning stages of it, even though we see a whole bunch of craziness already going down, going down since January 1st, if we don't get God's direction in our lives, again, we will not make it this year. At least not as Christians. Something needs to change within us. Something needs to change even outside of us. Something needs to change within our mindset, within the way that we put on our worldviews. Something needs to change within our perspectives and how we look at things and how we allow things to affect the very emotions that are, that are conjured up within our hearts when things happen. Something must change. And that something is our foundation. If our foundation does not change and becomes the very word of God, then it will be the very word of Satan that will take us out. It would be his word that throws us off. And so as, as he speaks to a person, for the great I am, he was a, I should say he was a spokesperson for the great I am, Solomon directs his audience to not forget God's law, as we see in verse 1. Solomon directs his audience to not forget his law, but to also go a step further in letting our hearts, right? Our hearts is the source of our being. It is the source of our life that deal with the issues of life, decisions, directions, emotions, and the whole of life and living. Whenever the Bible talks about the heart as we've been learning in discipleship and learning in, in, uh, in, in cell group and all the avenues that we have, whenever it talks about the heart, it is talking about the whole of your being. It is talking about all of you, the very facet that makes you a life, a living being. And he says that we must allow the word of God to deal with our hearts and to deal with it to such a degree that we keep God's commands. For they, the word of God, when it talks about they here in the, in the scriptures that we just read, they meaning the word of God, for they will add length of days, long life, and peace unto you. He goes on to say that we must not let mercy and truth. What is mercy and truth? It is a representation of God's word. And he says, do not let mercy and truth forsake us, but to bind them, God's word, around our neck as a necklace for all to see, but not just for everybody else to see. A necklace is also a reminder for us of who or what directs our lives. You see, many of us wear different kind of necklaces. Some of us wear necklaces of, of um, uh, crosses and different kind of necklaces of people's names and, and different kind of things. And so people wear necklaces for many different things, but a lot of times necklaces are like a memorial. They're a reminder of things. Some of us wear necklaces with like a wedding ring on there. We wear a necklace with our wife's name, you know. Some of us wear a necklace with like a heart and, or like half of a heart and then our spouse have the other half and it just reminds us of the love that we have for each other. Something like that, right? I, I don't know. But you know what I mean? In there, you guys know what I'm talking about. One person has the key, the other person has the lock. You guys know what I'm talking about? Right. It's just a reminder, like who has what, you know, what I mean, like the guy has the key, the woman has the heart or vice versa, whatever they fight for, whoever wins that battle. But nonetheless, it is a reminder to us of who we are and who's directing our lives. And the question is, what necklace do we have on today? Is it the necklace of the word of God or is it just a necklace that just reminds us of, of our past, reminds us of the, the very world to which we live in? What kind of necklace do we have on? King Solomon said to wear the word of God, to bind them, not just put them on, but to bind them around our neck, write them on the tablet of our hearts, he says, becoming the very source of our lives as his word, the word of God governs our being. For it is then in verse four that we will find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. We are commanded to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. It is to trust God with everything that we have. Trust comes from knowing and being led by God's word. You see, when we first get saved with God, we don't just trust him with everything. How many people know that? Some of us kind of in the world kind of built up and created this thing. Like the moment you become a Christian, you're supposed to be perfect now. 
You ain't supposed to be cursing. You're not supposed to be doing any of these things or whatever. No sin, no nothing. The moment you get saved, that's it. It doesn't really work like that. See, the moment I got saved, I didn't automatically just fall in love with Jesus. In fact, the moment that I started dating my wife, I didn't automatically fall in love with her. Maybe I did. I, I don't even, let me just take that back. <laughs> my wife did a good work on me, all right? My wife did a good work on me. And so, but just like many of us here, when you found your, your, your significant other, right? You didn't immediately just fall all in love with them, just head over heels. Some people do. Pray for them people, right? We love them people. But when it comes to God, we weren't automatically in love with him. You know what began to happen that we started to fall in love with Jesus is when we started to read his word. And we started to, you know, turn every page. And as we began to meditate upon the word of God, we began to trust God with our hearts. We began to trust God with our thoughts. We began to trust God with our footsteps. We began to touch, to trust God with the very hands that he has given us to do things and, and make things happen and create things. We began to trust God because in his word, we began to fall in love with the God that was already in love with us. We began to seek and read his word. That is why it's so important to make the word of God the very foundation of our lives because it is the word of God that shows us the love of God. It's the word of God that we hold on to, that we bind around our neck, that we trust with all of our hearts. It is the word of God that shows us the very God that created us and the very God that declares, I am your first love. Amen. It is that God who loves us first that allows us to love him in return and love everybody else that he has put in our lives and even those that we don't even know. It is the word of God that starts it all, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And so God gives us a commandment, not a suggestion, but a commandment. Trust in the Lord with all our hearts and not lean. eBay talked about leaning today during worship. And I, 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 I tr truly did not believe that that was a coincidence. I believe God was speaking through her. And so many of us are leaning on things that constantly break. And we fix them. We put duct tape on them. Some of them are our children. Some of them are our spouses. And that's why some of our spouses, even in this room, are tied up by your spouse because they have made you their God. Instead of drawing off God and trusting in God and trusting in his word, we have made our significant others, our children, the very people that we love, our God. And so therefore, we have binded them up. We have tied them up with our issues, with our things, with our leaning on them. And we're constantly breaking our spouses because they were never meant to be God, let alone the very word of God that's supposed to sustain our lives or that we can lean on. Yes, God gave us spouses like wives to be our helpmates and our backbone, but never to be the spouse that we lean on to such a degree that we break them because we don't have enough trust to trust in God who can never be broken. And so we're leaning and we're expecting and we're commanding our spouses to be God in our lives and they can never pay that bill. They can never pay that bill. And these are only some of the reasons why our marriages are failing. Because we have not trust God enough to trust him with our everything. And it starts by his word. And so listen, we cannot lean on this world, lean on another person. We must lean on somebody who is the rock that can never be broken. And so as to rely upon for support and inspiration, we cannot lean on our own understanding, which is an agreement of opinion or feeling, an adjustment of differences. That's why King Solomon said, do not lean on your own understanding. Why is that? Because your understanding and the adjustments of your understanding will go against the very word of God. And so we'll become double-minded people, pilling people that draw off feelings and emotions rather than the very truth of God's word. And so he continues. Instead, in all our ways, we are commanded to acknowledge God, his person, his word, his promises, his commands, his law, and he will direct our paths. It is not until we do all these things that are on these scriptures that in the very bottom toward the end that we read in verse six, that after we acknowledge him in all, in all, our, in all our ways to God, that he shall do what to our paths? Yeah. 
direct our paths. God is trying to get us to seek his direction tonight so that he can direct our paths, our lives. He promises to do so. And so he commands us not to be wise in our own eyes, assuming to know and apply what is best apart from God. Many of us continue to do that on a day-to-day basis, thinking that we know or can do better than God, and you can never outbless God. In fact, God's worst would always outweigh your best any given day. His worst would always outweigh our best. And because of that, we trust in his wisdom, or at least supposed to or commanded to do so. And so he commands us not to draw off our own wisdom, assuming to know and apply what is best from God. For we are to fear the Lord, knowing his wisdom and ways are best and therefore depart from evil. What is he talking about is the act of rebellion against God's word and ways and pursuit of our own. God calls that evil rebellion. Why is that? Because in the word of God, he says this, it is obedience that is better than sacrifice. Oh, man, I'm going to sacrifice, man. I'm, a, I'm just going to stay home, man. I'm going to cook some food or whatever for my mom. Or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Or like, oh, man, I'm going ahead and just, you know, play these video games. Or I'm going to watch Netflix. And, man, I'm just going to sacrifice today on the means of God's commands. And we're going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to chill out today. I'm going to sacrifice without realizing that the word of God says that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience. Whenever we come up to a decision, as we're going to learn tonight in seeking God's face, if that decision goes against the the commandments or to obey God, you should already know 100% of the time that God's going to say, obey me. But God, I got a flat tire. God, that means I'm going to have to jump on the bus. I'm going to have to do some stuff. Listen, obey me. But God this, but God that. No, obey me. But it's a sacrifice. God, I'm going to go help the homeless, though. I got to help my God up. I got a babysitter. I got to do X, Y, Z. No, obey me. Don't try to twist my word and say, God, but I'm going to serve other people, God, so I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z. God says, no, no, no. I don't accept that sacrifice. That's wisdom of this world. That's wisdom of your own. It's a wisdom that only leads to evil because it commits, uh, it commits disobedience to God's commands. It goes against the very God we serve. And so while we're thinking we're being noble and super Christians by helping other people out, God will never have us to disobey him in the same time time to say, God, but I'm I'm helping this person. Or God, I'm doing this on this way. God is like, I don't accept that. Because obedience is always better than sacrifice. And we have to learn that real fast. Because the, the enemy will have us like Mother Teresa. It'd be like Mother Brian, or brother, like Father Brian, or something like that, or or, or, or uh, Father Julian, or something like that. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, like we're helping everybody else, while at the same time being disobedient to God. And then we expect God to come through and say, "God, direct my paths. How can I? All you want to do is sacrifice, and then use my name behind it, while you're spitting on the same name that calls you to obey the name that I have given you." Chew on that just a little bit. It's the truth. And so he's saying, for when we do these things, it will be health to our flesh, to our external living, as God will give strength to our bones, which is our internal beings. And so after seeking God's freedom, as we talked about last week, and being made free, how many people got free last week? Can we give it up for Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, right? We got about seven people that got free. Praise the Lord, right? Mercy. But the crazy part is that after last week, after that Friday, we got free. Some of us went right back to bondage on, on Saturday. We got free on Friday, 7.30, 8.30, whatever p.m. We're at the altar. The whole place was packed up. You couldn't even walk around the altar. The whole place was packed. We were seeking God. And then the enemy came. And all of a sudden, by Saturday, 7 p.m., we were already back in bondage. I'm not going to have you guys raise your hand on that one (laughs) because I just know this is just how it is, right? But it don't have to be like that though. And so the thing is, how do we stay free and free indeed? It's the question tonight. We sought God's freedom. He made us free. But the issue that arises 
is how do we now stay free? How do we remain free and free indeed? How do we remain in it? It is for this reason we must seek God's direction. Look at the definition of direction here. Direction here. Direction is defined as guidance or supervision. All right, you guys got that? Guidance or supervision. Look what else it says. Guidance or supervision of action or conduct. It is management. When you seek God's direction, we are not just seeking it part-time. We are not just seeking it for our own glory, for our own purposes, so we can do us and then holler at God the next time we need him to direct our life again. When we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, then we're like, God, help me. My marriage is jacking up, God. Things are falling apart. God, help me now, God. And God is like, where have you been? I was trying to help you three weeks ago because I knew this was coming because I'm the Alpha and the Omega and everything in between. I already seen this coming three weeks ago. Why do you think I was trying to get your attention? Why do you think I had those people text you? Hit you up on, on, on Facebook or on Messenger. Why do you think I had the ladies reach out to you and say, how are you doing? Why do you think I had the men reach out to you, the pastor reach out to you? Because I was trying to get your attention. Because I knew next week what the enemy was going to try to do. And I was trying to prepare you for it. But you wouldn't let me guide you. You wouldn't let me supervise you. You wouldn't let me manage you. And see, the problem with us today is that we want to be renegades. We don't want a pastor. We don't want a disciple. We don't want a manager. We just want to do it all by ourselves. And I come to tell you that God never intended for us to do it by ourselves at all. He never intended that. Read the Bible. Read it. When he wrote letters to Paul, it was letters to churches. The only people that got letters individually was Timothy and individuals that are already pastors, or Onesimus, because he was he was a, 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 a owner of another uh, another uh, Philemon, Philemon, an uh, owner of another brother in Christ who was a slave, and he wrote to him to deliver this person. But other than that, every letter was written to churches, or written to pastors who were over churches that were called to disciple and supervise and guide and manage the people that were in their congregation. And so, if we claim to say that we are disciples without a pastor, you are not a disciple. If we claim to say we are in discipleship and yet you're not in discipleship, nobody's over your life, nobody's in your life, literally teaching you, helping you, rebuking you, correcting you, training you as the word of God that was given to Timothy was given so that he can read in front of his church that the word of God is perfect for this. You are not a disciple. Read your Bible. I am a disciple of God. He said, I got to pick up my cross and follow after him. He left and he said, now you disciple apostles, you now go do what I commanded you to do. That means he gave the responsibility to the apostles and the very leaders in the church to disciple other people because he says, I'm leaving. I'm going to give you a helper so that he can help you disciple these crazy people. And so to say that we are still disciples of Jesus Christ, but yet do it opposite of what Jesus Christ has said, you are deceived and the truth is not in you. That's a tough word, but it's a real word. And we all need to receive that. You don't believe me? Read your Bibles. Read your Bibles. And so we need a supervisor. We need guidance. We need management. Why is that? Because we need direction. Without the word of God, we are left to our own devices. And look where, just think about this for a quick second. Look where our own devices has led us already. I know where it led me. I've cheated, committed adultery, did a whole bunch of things outside of God. Child out of wedlock, right? Pornography, sexual morality, all these things. Because I wasn't allowing God to guide, supervise, and manage my life. And every time I did not let him do that, and every time I did not allow myself to be discipled by somebody else, I failed. And the reality is, I would keep falling if I don't allow people in my life. Yes, your pastor gets discipled too. My four other leaders that are as crazy as me, and I love them. They will rebuke me. They will correct me. They may even hit me in the back of the head. Steve, stop your nonsense. You better man up right now. I mean, just hard stuff. Pray for your boy. It's like abuse. <laughs> 
But see, we all need supervision. We need guidance. We need, man we need management within our lives. To remain free and free indeed, we need direction. We need guidance. We need supervision over our actions and our conduct. We need new management. I want to say that again. You need, I need, we need new management. If God were to do one of those, uh, what's that thing that they do at, at the jobs, right? On a quarterly basis or something like that? What's that called? Yeah. Help me. Evaluation. Right, evaluations, right? If God were to do the evaluation, you know what he said? You are fired as a manager. Get you a new management. Get some disciple in your life. Get the word of God in your life. You need new management. And say, no, God don't need no new management. God, I'm good. I'm decent. I read your Bible. I got this, God. And God is like, you're doing it all by yourself. You're doing it all by yourself. And I never intended that. I never intended that. We need new management. Because our own management apart from God drew and draws us away from God and his past purposes and will for our lives. We need new management and that management must and is the word of God. Many of us have sought God's face before. We sought God's freedom like we did last week. We even sought God's direction for a time, but it is in this area of direction or the lack thereof that we lose heart, trust in, and stop leaning on that only thing that leads us back to the pits from where we come from, which is a place of no direction at all. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Just like some of us was free last week, and by Sunday you are already back into captivity, it's because we lack God's direction. And so what is it to seek God's direction? It is to seek to hear from God both audible and through his word with the intent to apply his direction to our lives no matter how much it goes against our, uh, goes against our better judgment, no matter how much it goes against our wisdom, no matter how much it goes against our knowledge and understanding, no matter if it goes against us, period. We need God's direction. This takes for one to meditate and ponder on the word of God and what he has said and shown you more than what you are seeing or saying in your own life. We have to go beyond what we see in here. We have to go to the very presence of God and the word of God to hear what thus says the Lord rather than thus what Steve said, rather than thus what you guys said, rather than thus what the world says. No, I need to hear what thus says God, even if it goes against my own word. And so once we have been made free, we must stay free. And that takes for us to hear and apply God's word for direction by seeking God's direction. You guys can open up your Bibles to the body of our message today, which is Isaiah 58, 9b through 11. And the word of God says this, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then, somebody say then, yes. your light would rise in the darkness and your night will become the, like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Some of these things are familiar from last week because last week we spoke about these things. But God sought it to say it again with reason. After hearing the closing of verse 9, the first part of verse 9, or the latter part of verse 9 before we got into 9b, in that God would say, here I am. You guys remember that last week? That was the last part of the verse we ended with. God said, you will, you will pray to me, you will cry out to me, and I would say, here am I. You guys remember that? Some of y'all are like, I wasn't even here last week. We'll pray for you guys, all right? But he said, here am I. After he sets us free from ourselves and the grips of the enemy, our response, after God tells us, here am I, our response must be an emphatic, Lord, here am I. We're crying out to God. We're praying to the Lord, seeking his face. And God is saying, here am I. Our, our response to God saying, here am I, should always be, God, here am I. Why is that important? Because when God says, here I am, or here am I, he's letting you know, I am here for you. But after that, our response should be, God, here am I. What does that mean? God, direct me. God, lead me. God, guide me. Supervise me. Manage me. Watch over my conduct. Watch over my speech. Watch over my life, God. Which direction should I take? 
This response to the Lord's declaring, here am I, is one that asks for direction and guidance to fill the blank or hole after one has been made free. We have to understand that the moment that God sets us free, there is now a void in that place. It can be pornography. It can be uh, smoking weed. It can be alcoholism. It can be whatever that thing is. Now there's a void, empty hole in that place. What must go there? Yes. His word must go there. And that only comes as you let God direct our lives. God will lead you to fill the void that you were so used to doing. There's a void there now. Man, I did, I did pornography, man, for 20-some years. What am I supposed to do now in my leisure time? I know it sounds crazy, but this is some real struggles. This is some real stuff. I dealt with it. It's real stuff. What do I do now? Who, who am I now? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do now? And God is saying, well, if you allow me to direct your life and guide you, I will put my word there so that you won't go back to the very captivity to which I set you free from. And many of us are going through this revolving door and we got to get tired and sick and tired of just going through the same revolving door every single year, year after year. It's like we find ourselves in the same pit to which God already gave us a ladder and gave us his word to get out of. And we're still in that same pit. We find ourselves right back in the same pothole, going down the same street that God said not to go left. Instead, we went left. Instead, we're supposed to go right. And we find ourselves in the same thing, doing the same thing, expecting different results. And what does that mean? Insanity. Some of us are insane in here, not in a good way. Not in like the Cypress Hill way either. You know what I mean? That's the way throwback. Y'all probably don't even know about Cypress Hill, but he was a savage back then. Insane in the brain, most definitely. And so listen to this, right? That must be our response. It is to say what Paul said after being set back. I'm sorry, after being set free in Acts, in Acts chapter 9, verse 6. This is the New King James Version. And he says this. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. After Paul was free, the only response he had, and we must have, is, Lord, what would you have me to do? How would you guide me? How would you direct me? What direction would you have me to go on? It is to ask and make God our direction to guide us along the rest of our lives, knowing it was we. You and I that directed and guided our own lives to utter darkness, wickedness, and sin. That's what we did with our own lives. And God is saying, if you direct me, I can leave you and lead you opposite of those directions. After directing the Israelites, in this case right here, the Israelites to freedom, God reiterates some of the things he wanted to set them free from. He did this not to remind them of their previous state, but to direct them along his paths and ways for living. We are so fond. Listen to this. We are so fond of trying to direct God. We're trying to direct God, the creator of heaven and earth, in our paths, in our ways, that we fail to recognize that it is not about us, but, the, but about the God we now serve who desires to direct us down his paths and his ways. This is the difference between true praying and true fasting. It is not to direct God down our own paths and ways. Many people have started, many churches, in fact, have started praying and fasting the same day we started and they did a 21-day fast. But when you begin to listen to some of these folks, when you begin, begin to like kind of really understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, what they're saying, you begin to see like, no, wait a minute. You're praying and fasting? Yeah. Why are you trying to direct God? Because it sounds like you're praying and fasting for you to invite God in your life so you can lead God down your paths and down your ways. When initially what God is saying right here is like, no, no, it doesn't work like that. We pray and fast to return to God so that we can have God direct us down his paths and down his ways. Why are we still trying to grab God and direct God and invite him in our lives so that we can take him down our paths and our ways? It's not a true fast. It's not even true praying. God is calling us so that he can direct us down his paths and down his ways. It is not to direct God, God down our, our paths or our ways, but to be directed by God and that by his word. 
And so as we go on to break these things down, God gives us five directives of what we must do that leads to staying free as he responds by doing four things for us. Many times in God's word, just to give us an understanding here, there is our part that leads to God's part, such as do that and I will do this. God does that throughout his word. You do this and I promise to do this. If you do that, I'm going to promise to do this, right? It's like a give or take. Amen. And so it's not that we have to earn our salvation, nothing like that. But God has sets of rules, sets of things that for us to do. Because once we do that, God will do this. The problem is that we don't want to do that, but we're expecting still for God to do this. That is the problem with Western civilization over here in America. Oh, we love for God to do this, but we hate that we have to do that. I don't want to do that. That takes too long. If I can't put it in a microwave and hit popcorn on it, I don't want to mess with it. If I can't just cook it up real fast, two minutes and be gone, I'm not doing that. Because of the this that you want me to do in order for you to do that, I can get this or get that instant gratification through sex, drugs and my own past and my own ways. But without realizing that that doing it on your own would only lead you back to the this that God delivered you from. And that is captivity. It is bondage. It is sin and more sin. And so we have to understand this is what he is doing. In these verses and so what are we called what we are called to do our part three spiritual directions that deal with the with the internal self that affects everyone else also as it affects ourselves it will begin to affect everyone else amen and so this is the first one do away with the yoke of oppression it's the first thing that God tells us in that scriptures amen if you guys want to go back, I'm not going to have the scriptures up here, but if you guys can go back to Isaiah 58, and it's, uh, it's in verse uh, 9, or verse, yeah, verse 9, the end of verse 9. And so, do away the yoke of oppression. We talked about this last week, about God wanting to set us free and to untie the yokes of oppression. But he brings it back up, and he brings it up as a first means now, with reason. Why is that? The first direction and guidance God gives is to do away with the yoke of oppression. It is to say to take away the yokes of oppression in our midst. That whatever yoke that has come upon us, right? We talked about last week that a yoke is a wooden beam that is upon our shoulders. It is the very thing that keeps us down and it leads us as it's attached by leather straps by someone like the farmer who is straddling away the oxen and they pulling them right, they go right. Put them left, they go left. And so God is saying, remove, take away the yoke of oppression. He's saying to take away, get rid of that thing, remove it once and for all. But in this regard and in this context, he's actually telling us to make a trade. See, a yoke can be the very foundation to which we carry on our shoulders. It is the thing that we take everywhere in our lives. Some of us have yokes on our backs of wickedness and sin. And it's a no wonder we can't even drive to work peacefully any given Monday morning. Nine times out of ten, we're probably running late anyways because it's Monday, right? And so we're on the 9094, driving as fast as we can because we're running late. And we just begin to like see all the traffic and everything going on. And we begin to lose our ever-loving mind with frustration and all the things that the enemy begins to pour inside of us. That we want to go left and we're trying to cut the lanes, but people don't let us go. So then we start cursing in our minds and in our hearts and uh, we start hating our brother, which is murder and uh, murder in, internally. And so we have to do away with the very yokes of oppression. Why would God result back to this directive after already addressing it in verse 6? Because he is directing the Israelites and us in what must take the place of this yoke of oppression. It's the spiritual and the mental weighing down. That's the definition of oppression. And so how do we free or how do we stay free from the spiritual and mental weighing down from the yoke of oppression? By putting, on, by putting on us the yoke of God's word. It's putting on the yoke of God's word. Look at Matthew eleven twenty eight. Some of us know this verse by heart. We use it a lot in this church. Come to me. How many people? 
all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Look what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. To take upon us the yoke of Jesus is to take upon us the word of God to which he is and to whom and what we must learn from to be directed through the temptation to oppress and be oppressed or weighed down spiritually, physically, and mentally. It is to be yoked with the word of God that in essence is to change the foundation of our lives to the word of God. Look at Psalm Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my what? And a light to my what? That's our whole life. It's a lamp unto my feet. Your feet represent the actions, the directions you're going in life. Left, right, straight, backwards, whatever it is. He's saying that his word must be a lamp unto our feet so that we can see before us what direction we are going. Oh God, your word saying make it right, let me make that right. God, your word saying make that left. Let me make that left. Oh, God, your word saying leave this person alone. Let me, yeah, yeah you got to go. Sorry, homie. But why? But why? I love you. Don't no, you don't, man. God bless you. I'll holler at you. I'm going this way. It is the word of God that directs our feet on the path that we ought to take. And then it's a light unto our path that is letting us know we must go this way. Or we must go that way. Or we must go this way. This is the long haul. This is where God is leading me at. Amen. And so this is an indication of God's word being the foundation of our lives. That is a lamp that directs my feet, which is our action in life and a light on the path of God would have us to take. And then we got number two, do away with the pointing of finger. The first one he deals with our foundation. The next one he deals with us pointing the finger at other people. This is, this is huge within the church. We love to say, oh man, it's the pastor's fault. It's the deacon's fault. It's, it's, it's this guy's fault. It's my kid's fault. They don't know how to be quiet. It's this and that and the other. Oh, man, it's, just, it's the worship, man. You guys need to start using live instruments and stuff like that. And the whole time, it ain't nobody else's fault but your own. But we don't know how to take ownership and responsibility for our own walk with God. We blame everybody else. Youth, blame their adults, blame the church. They don't have a youth group, though. They don't have this. They don't have that. How are you applying yourself? This is the same word that I would preach at a youth group. I was a youth pastor. You don't believe me. Ask them. They were in the youth. Would I not preach these same messages like this in youth? And youth would give their lives to Jesus or oh, whatever. You know what I mean? Go from there. And so we have to apply ourselves and make the word of God the very lamp into our feet and the light into our path. And we need to stop pointing the finger. Pointing of the finger was what the Israelites did. They blamed everyone else for their issues, captivities, enslavement, oppression, and rebellion. We too fall into the pit of blaming others and pointing the finger at everyone else without realizing, right? Somebody point the finger at me. Just point the finger at me. Everybody point the finger at me. How we point? Stupid old pastor. Always rebuking me. Always coming at me with the word of God. Keep it up like that. I want you to keep it up like this. a reason. Right? So dumb. Tired of this pastor. Him and his bald head, orange shirt. Get him, right? So we too fall like this, right? But every time we're pointing a finger at somebody else, how many fingers are pointing at us? Three fingers are pointing at ourselves. Why is that? You think God was just trying to be funny? I think God was trying to get our attention way before he created our human anatomy. The son, stop pointing a finger at somebody else. And begin to look at yourself three times more than you look at one time your neighbor or somebody else. Look at yourself three times more. Examine yourself three times more than how you're looking and considering somebody else. And so we are to take ownership and responsibility of our own actions while examining ourselves under the scope of the word of God. We must do this. Look what the Bible says here. Matthew 7, 3 on down. Why do you look at the speck or of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? This is Jesus talking, sassy, loving Jesus. Jesus in the manger, right? Somebody just love to keep him in. Now, this is awesome Jesus, direct Jesus, very, very mm, Jesus. And he says this, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. 
when all the time there was a plank in your own eye. You know the difference between a speck and a plank? Dude, this thing will be sticking out of your eyeball, smacking everybody with it like this, and you're worrying about the speck in this person's eye. Look at this person. Look at the speck in their eye. Call themselves deacons and leaders. Look at Pastor Steve doing this, that, and the other. Looking at the specks in somebody else's eye, but haven't realized there's a weird object growing and getting bigger in your eye. You can't even see, dude. He says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Again, he's saying, do away with the points of a finger. Look at yourself three times more than you're looking at somebody else and examine yourself with the word of the living God. From putting the word of God upon us and making it our foundation, we must now use the word of God to examine our lives. God is directing us to allow the word of God to examine our lives as we seek God's direction that we may live according to his word. The first one, he says, the word of God must be your foundation. The second one, he says, the word of God must be the examination in your life. It must examine you. It must go right through you. It must show you, not everybody else with a speck in their eye, but to show you all the logs that are in your own eye. Look at Hebrews 4.12, Amplified Bible. For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow. Look at this. The deepest parts of our nature. Exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God must must be allowed to examine our lives so they can show us us and what we need to work on. Number three, do away with malicious talk. Somebody say malicious. malicious. Such a savage word, man. Like if I had another child, I was going to name him malicious. Malicious, get your butt over here. It just sounds awesome. But it's, it's not a good word, right? The definition of malicious is as a desire to cause pain, injury, or distress to another. Horrible word. And so from examining our lives with the word of God, we must allow the word of God to change our speech. Our speech. Why does God want to talk about our talk? He tells us, man, let the word of God now be the foundation of your life. Let it direct your life entirely. And then he says, let the word of God examine your life. And then from there, he, he says, do not let no malicious talk come out of your mouth. It's kind of random if you don't study what God is trying to say in the scriptures. But look at this. Look, look at what the word says. Ephesians 4.29, Amplify Version. Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. But only such speech is as is good for building up others. How should we be talking? To do what to others? To build up others according to the need on the occasion so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. Our speech. Let me get them out of fact. Let me look at the next one. Luke 6, 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. But look at what the Bible goes on to say. Jesus says, for let's all say this together. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Some of y'all couldn't even read that verse because you're like, oh, man, my heart is jacked up. If y'all would only known the stuff I was saying on the way over here. If y'all only known I wanted to crash the car with me and my spouse in the car. Not me, I'm just an example, right? Some of us, right? We don't do that in this church. We, we too holy in this church to do this. But, right, so even on the way this way, the speech coming out of our mouths. And yet, what is God trying to say? Our speech and talk reflect our hearts. Therefore, the word of God must be applied to our hearts that it may reflect our speech and that for God. God is saying, do away with malicious talk by directing us to replace the abundance of our hearts with his word. Our talk reveals our heart. Why does he say, do away with malicious talk? Because he knows out of your malicious talk comes from a very source that is your whole being, which is your heart. 
It causes us to want to ask ourselves the question, what is the abundance of my heart? Well, you can know the abundance of the heart if you could just have your recorder of your phone on as you're driving and going throughout your day. And then in the end of the day, play back everything that you have said out of your mouth and you will see what is the abundance of your heart. And God is saying, replace that with my word. Instead of having that thing in your heart, instead of harboring malicious talk and bitterness and things like that, how many people know that we talk more from our heart and in our mind than we actually do with words? We have more conversations in our heart and in our mind about other people, sometimes including ourselves, than we do with actual real people. And what does it show us even in there? The abundance of our hearts. Some of us even now sitting here are wondering, when am I going to end? <laughs> and it's just showing the abundance of the heart. Like, God, you taking too much of my time, God. Like, this is it. We went overtime on worship. I know that, God. But look, they ain't got to continue to just keep preaching like this. All right, I've been convicted since verse the first verse he gave me. I just want to pray now. You know what I mean? We'll get there. But God has to give us this. Amen? But it shows us the abundance of the heart. Even little things like that. It just shows us where your heart's at. That we can sit before, like, who's in the playoffs? I don't even know. Football. Who, who's in the playoffs? We, y'all don't even know. Is, is there even playoffs going on? I don't even know. But somebody's in the playoffs. The Bears made the playoffs. We will sit in front of the Bears, right, and cheer, do backflips, cartwheels or whatever, sip on stuff, do everything, right? We're about to tomorrow, whoever's going to come by the house is going to sit in front of our TV and watch a UFC fight for that starts at about 7 o'clock all the way to about 12, midnight, or 1 p.m. without any complaining. Well, if we don't have any food, y'all be complaining, but we're going to have some food there. So it's like, we're good. We ain't going to complain at all. And so what is God saying? Check our hearts. Let the word check our hearts. What is the abundance of our hearts? Amen. And so we move on to the next one, the two physical directions that deal with the external self that affects everyone else. Number four, spend yourself. Somebody say spend yourselves. Spend yourself. I really had to study for this one because I'm like spend yourself. Even me saying spend yourself. Y'all like he about to start talking about shopping, going to the mall and spending myself. And I've been waiting for a message like this all year since I got my stimulus check. Because I already know I got another stimulus check coming, hopefully, for the Democratic Party. So I'm going to spend this first one and I'll just say the next one. And so now, Pastor, I want to hear this because I want to spend myself this weekend. I need to shop until I drop because I got that young stimulus check. <laughs> God have mercy, right? <laughs> to spend ourselves. What does it mean? It means to spend ourselves in behalf of the hungry. It's to become selfless and servants of the less fortunate. Half of y'all smiles just got off your face after I just said that. <laughs> You're like shopping, yes. And they're like, no, shopping for the homeless. Always got to be given. But it's on behalf of the hungry, as the word of God says. When the word of God begins to direct our hearts, it gives us the hearts of God. A heart to serve. Look at Acts 20, 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, somebody say hard work, hard work. we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. God is calling us to spend ourselves what is the example that God gives us? This is the apostles talking here, and they were, mind, they were reminded, and the reason why they worked hard in serving the people and spreading the gospel, being in prison, being beaten half to death. Some of them, like Paul, even had to lie and pretend dead and beat them so bad, took them out of the gates. You guys read the book of Acts. He had to lay there and fake dead, and then when they were gone, he looked around and got up and ran off because they beat him half to death. He was half alive and half dead. And then he woke up, but yet he continued to work hard to continue to serve people that can never give him anything in return. Where did he get this heart from? Where did he get this mindset from? He got it from the very word of God. When the word of God begins to mess and direct our hearts, it will give us the heart of God to serve. When Jesus died on the cross, listen to this, he spent himself for everyone else. Listen. This is what happened. 
He might not have been able to hear everyone, heal everyone, right? You know, he was walking around, healing folks, casting out demons, healing leprosy, doing all these other good stuff, right? He was doing these things, but he couldn't reach everybody. Not everybody received their healing. Not everybody got Jesus to spend a night at their, their house and play video games. Not everybody got Jesus to sit down and drink some wine with him. Not everybody got a chance to have a, a literal relationship with Jesus on earth. Not everybody was able to do that. And Jesus knew this. He wasn't able to heal everyone. He wasn't able to give to everyone. He wasn't able to visit everyone. He wasn't able to speak with everyone while he was walking the face of the earth. But you know what he said to himself and others? I can die for everyone. I might not be able to spend myself now and do these very things, but I can spend myself by dying on the cross for everyone. For everyone. Hallelujah. I can spend myself in such a way to serve the whole world by dying for the whole world to have an opportunity to be healed, to give to everyone that would want salvation and heaven's riches, to visit everyone through a personal relationship and to speak to everyone through my word, all who would be willing to listen. All who would be willing to listen. It is the word himself that exemplified a life spent for others. When the word of God directs us spiritually, we will be more prone to be directed by it physically. The reason why it's hard for us to let God lead us physically is because we have yet to allow him to direct and lead us spiritually. We haven't submitted fully. We haven't made the word of God fully our foundation, fully the examination of our lives. We have not allowed the word of God to be the word of God in our lives because we're too busy holding on to our own words, our own agenda, our own direction, our own paths, our own guidance. We're too busy being the managers of our own lives. And God is saying, I'm just waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. You're not waiting for me to come through. I'm waiting for you to stop and submit so I can be the Lord over your life, my word. And so number five, Satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Satisfy the needs of the oppressed. The word of God says this, Matthew 10, 5, these 12, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or into any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. He says, satisfy the needs of the oppressed. When God, God's word deals with us spiritually, we're able to give physically. And so instead of taking the oppressed, God is directing us to satisfy the needs of the oppressed. We no longer are consumers of God's blessings and riches. We are givers of that which has been given to us. These kind of things don't affect us the way they used to. We're looking for opportunities to serve. We're looking for opportunities to give. When we come to church, we're looking for, for somebody to tell us what we can do, how we can serve. That is the heart of God. And that can only be reflected in the physical as we allow God's word to deal with us in the spiritual. We have to allow God's word to be God's word in our lives. And so we move on from there. As the scripture did in, in 10C, it says, Then your light will shine, will rise in the darkness, and your nights will become like the noonday. It is then that we may stay free, and free indeed, when we allow the word of God to direct our lives and remove the darkness that is within us, that we may bring light to others. When we neglect the direction and guidance of God and his word is when we find ourselves bound and chained by our own direction and guidance that leads us into captivity. God is trying to direct us into who we really are. And as Peter declares, look what he says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of where? Darkness, Darkness into his wonderful light. He said, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. 
And so the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And in closing, it is the Lord who will guide and take care of us when we are directed and guided by him to take care of others as we are directed by his word to go down his paths and down his ways. He will direct and guide us into doing what God will do. Number one, satisfying our needs in a sun-scorched land. The word of God says this, Give and will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Even during a sun-scorched land, that's like a deserted land. God is still able to satisfy our needs. That when his word is the actual word that is our foundation and does what we just spoke about, is when God begins to stand up and to say, son, I got you. Don't even worry about it. I got you. I will satisfy your needs, even in a sun-scorched land. He will strengthen your frame. The Bible says, but those who wait for the Lord, who expect, expect, look for, and hope him will gain new strength and renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles rising toward the sun. They will run and not grow weary or become weary. They will walk and not grow tired. God is saying, I will strengthen your frame when my word is your foundation and is director of your life, the supervisor, the guider, the protector, the manager of your life. I will strengthen your frame every single time. And then number three, be a well-watered garden. And number four, be a spring whose water never fails. Those last two are summed up in Psalm chapter one, verse one through three. As you guys, if you guys can stand. The Bible says, blessed Somebody say blessed. blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. They don't stand in the way that sinners take. They don't sit in the company of mockers. We're not directed by the wicked. We're not led by sinners. We're not supervised or managed by mockers. Instead, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. It's the word of God. And who meditates on his law day and night. They have made the word of God their foundation. That person, somebody say that person, person. is like a tree planted by streams of water. That's what God said he will do in the last two, in the last two sections, the number three, number four. He said he will, play, he will be like a tree planted by the streams of water, meaning his tree will never die out. He will always produce fruit, which yields his fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, it prospers. This is the man and woman God is directing us to be. And it all begins and ends with the word of God. The question I have for us is who's directing? Who's guiding? who's supervising, and who's managing your life. Would you make the Word of God your foundation, your director, your guide, your supervisor, and the manager of your life as you live in the land of the living? Can you guys hit these lights, please?